We thank you for your kindness towards us. <clears throat> thank you for your mercy. You are good and greatly to be praised. Um, I pray and I thank you for the season that you are putting, bringing us into. A season of new beginning. A season of salvation. A season, Father, of your anointing and your blessing. I bless you. I thank you. I praise you. Open our hearts to hear your word. Open our, our, our eyes to see your word. In the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Okay. So, um, today's teaching is going to be called, This is the Condemnation, and This is the Salvation. Okay. This is the Condemnation, and this is the Salvation. First scripture we're going to turn to is Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11. It's very good to take notes of the scriptures. I know that uh, take notes of different teachings. I know that in my life, I've grown tremendously in time periods where I looked at the scriptures during messages and took notes. So that's a very helpful thing to do if you don't have a notebook that um, you can keep scriptures and messages in. I highly suggest you do it because it's a very useful thing to learn kinesthetically. A lot of times people hear, um, sometimes people learn better um, auditorily or through the ears. Sometimes people learn better visually or through the eyes. But a lot of times people learn better kinesthetically. And part of kinesthetic learning is writing it. And so when you write down the things that God shows you when you're listening to a message, what you're doing is you're learning all three ways at once. And when you learn all three ways at once, when you learn all three ways at once, you learn best. Okay, so learning visually is reading the Bible. Learning uh, orally or auditorily is hearing the Bible. That's when you're hearing somebody talk. Learning kinesthetically is taking notes and doing. So the Bible talks about how we need to have it in our ears and our eyes and also to write it down. So um, when you come to service, you come to worship, not only having your own Bible, but also having a notebook is helpful because you can learn all three ways. And things stick more when you learn auditorily, when you learn visually, and when you learn kinesthetically by writing and taking notes. Because there's some things that I might not say that the Holy Spirit will say. And you can write down the things that the Holy Spirit says to you while I'm teaching the Word. So that's just a pro tip, as they say, <laughs> um, to have a notebook. For, for sermons, a notebook for messages. It's good to have a notebook for your own personal prayer time, a notebook for your dreams, a notebook for journaling, and a notebook for the messages and service. Mm -hmm. All right, so Hebrews 11, verse 7, it says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of the things not um, of things not seen as yet, move with fear. Everybody say, move with fear. Move with fear. fear. Noah moved with fear because he was warned. And what did he do? He did some kinesthetic learning. He prepared. He did something physically. He prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. So by faith, Noah was warned, and he moved with fear. So Noah was warned, 
and he moved with fear. And he acted on it. He acted on saving. He built an ark. He saved his house. And then the scripture says, by the which he condemned the world. Mm. So when Noah took action in obedience, he condemned the world. Okay? So, Noah got warned, and he also warned others. Noah took action on the warning. Okay? But then other people, they did not take action on the warning. What did they do? They hardened their heart. Okay? They ended up, what? Condemned. Because when the boat, when the, the rain came and the flood came, only eight people survived. Everybody else died because they did not heed the warning. The warnings of God are condemnation to those whose hearts are too hard to receive the warning and obey it. The warnings of God are condemnation to those whose hearts are too hard to receive the warning and obey it. The warnings of God are a lifeline of salvation to those whose hearts are soft enough to receive, to receive and obey the, obey the word. So the warnings of God are from God, right? They're from the spirit of Yah. They're from, they're from the Most High. Whether the warnings are condemnation or whether they are salvation is up to you. Sometimes when you warn people about God's judgment or you warn people about some instruction that he has given, he will say, oh, you're condemning, oh, you're negative, right? But some people, their hearts are soft and they receive it as salvation. Like, thank you for helping me. Thank you for telling me the right thing. Okay? Noah received the warning of God and he received it as a lifeline, a lifeline of salvation because his heart was soft and righteous enough to change according to the word of God. But those that were hard-hearted, they received it as condemnation. They didn't like it. All oh, that's negative. All oh, that's condemning. And then it, they ended up being condemned because they did not obey the warning of God. So not only did Noah have a soft heart to receive the warning as a lifeline of salvation and act on it, but when he acted on it, the Bible says that he condemned the world. So Noah's action condemned the world. Noah built something that condemned the world. Noah built the Ark of Salvation. And he condemned the world by building that Ark. Why? Because when Noah built the Ark of Salvation, God was able to send the flood. <laughs> And when he sent the flood, the world was condemned, right? Sometimes you can build, sometimes your obedience to God will condemn other people. That's why a lot of people feel condemned when they see you obeying God. Because people uh, feel condemned when they see you obeying God, okay? Okay. Sometimes people will hate you because you are building something that condemns them. When, you, when they saw Noah building their ark, right? Oh, he thinks he's righteous. Oh, he thinks God's going to punish us. Oh, that, that crazy, right? He was building something that condemned everybody else, and they didn't like it, okay? Sometimes people will hate the fact that you're obeying God because it makes them feel guilty. Instead of receiving it as a lifeline and as something to do and something to aspire to, um, they take it as a condemnation. Okay? They take it as a condemnation. But really, it doesn't have to be a condemnation. It can be something that is a lifeline of salvation. But depends on how their heart is, the way it makes them feel. Your obedience to God shows them his instructions. Because if God tells them not to have sex before marriage and they know it, and they see you not they see you 
not having sex before marriage. You're reminding them of God's instructions and you're reminding them of the punishment that they have coming or that they um, that they need to be forgiven for for their disobedience. Or say you honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy, set apart. When they see you doing that, it feels like condemnation because you're showing them God's instruction. Okay? So, it's important that we understand that as we obey God, not only are we offering people a lifeline of salvation, but we're also showing people their condemnation as well, depending on who they are. Okay? Depending on how their heart, if their heart is ready for truth or not. Okay? Some people don't want to acknowledge the reality that obedience is required by God. Obedience is required and there are punishments for disobedience, right? When God told Noah to build the boat, it wasn't optional. He had to. A lot of people would like to think that your obedience to God is optional. Oh, we don't have to do that. Oh, we don't have to keep his commandments. Oh, we don't have to do what Jesus said. Oh, we don't have to be saved. Oh, we don't have to choose Jesus. We can choose any other religion, right? But that's not really reality. We have to have a firm foundation in the fact that our obedience is important to him and our obedience saves us uh, from punishment. Um, let's go to Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 4, it says, They that forsake the law praise the wicked, but such as keep the law contend with them. You know what contend means? Contend means to argue and to, to fight with someone. So when you keep the law, no, when you forsake the law, you're praising the wicked. When you do whatever you want and you don't keep God's commandments, you're praising the wicked. Like, go ahead, wicked person. You're okay. You'll be all right. Because I'm not obeying God either. We go, you know, we all in this together, right? But when you keep the law, you're fighting with the wicked. Your obedience fights with the wicked people. So that's why when people see your obedience, they feel offended because you're fighting with them because you're not doing the same thing they do. To some people, it feels like condemnation. But to other people, it can be a lifeline of salvation. When people see you doing the right thing, it can convict them. And it can give them hope like, oh, it is possible to live right. It is possible to do the right thing. It is possible to be saved. It is possible to follow the salvation of God. Okay? When you obey God, your obedience is contending with their disobedience. That's why some people just may not like you. You don't know why they don't like you. But they just don't like you because they if they see you doing what's right, they just they just hate you because you're showing them that they're doing what's wrong. Okay, so it's important to understand that the Bible says those that live desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Why? Because of this. Because when you live godly, you're automatically fighting with somebody that lives ungodly because you're showing them the condemnation and you're showing them the judgment. That's coming on a disobedience. And this happens without you even trying. All you have to do is listen to God and obey God. And people are going to feel condemned. All you have to do is listen to God and obey God. And people are going to automatically feel like you're fighting with them. Okay. And it's important to understand this. Because this is the condemnation. Alright. Now let's go to John chapter 3. 
John chapter 3. Where are you going? John chapter 3. Verse 17. It said, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So the purpose of God sending his son is not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Okay, so we have the same thing. We have condemnation and we have salvation. The purpose is for salvation. The boat, God told Noah to build the ark for what purpose? To save them. To save them. <laughs> but those that rejected it didn't get saved. They received condemnation. Same thing with Jesus Christ. God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. Right? Verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. So again, it depends on the heart that you receive so the warning. When you don't believe on the Son of God, you are already condemned. But when you believe, you're not condemned. So condemnation and salvation are two sides of the same coin. It doesn't depend on the messenger. It doesn't depend on the message. It depends on the, how you hear the message. It depends on how you hear and how you receive the messenger. Okay? He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. In verse 19, And this is the condemnation. That light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Okay? This is the condemnation. This is the condemnation that light came into the world. This is the condemnation that the warning came before destruction. This is the condemnation that the Son of God came to save, and men chose not to believe. This is the condemnation that the warning came that God was going to flood the earth and men chose not to believe. This is the condemnation. Condemnation is when you choose to reject the warning. Condemnation is when you choose to reject the message of truth. Condemnation is when you choose to reject the messenger of heaven. This is the condemnation that light has come into the world. Condemnation is when you, when a light comes into the world, shining the light of truth, telling you this is reality, telling you this is what's really going on, telling you this is what the Word of God says. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. When light comes into the world and it shows you, okay, you know what? This is evil. I need to get out of this. Stop doing this. Stop doing that. Right? This is false doctrine. We need to start doing right. We need to start doing truth. When light comes into the world and says, you know, a large portion of the medical industry is based on sorcery. Sorcery is in the Bible and it's deception. You have a choice to make when light comes into the world. You can either change and start to love the light, or you can choose to love darkness rather than light. Okay, and you want to stick with your old-fashioned deeds. When you have a lot invested in evil, and then you hear, you find out that your evil is evil, <laughs> it's hard to disinvest in because you've put so much into evil, you spent so much time and so much money, right? But this is the condemnation. Condemnation is when light comes into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Okay? When light comes into the world, <laughs> exposing truth that the 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 coronavirus was a, a, a pandemic and a scam, people that did not want to hear that, 
they had a lot of people die around them because they did not want to hear the truth. But the people that did listen and did hear it were able to save themselves, save their family members, okay? And save anybody else that will listen. Why? Why? Because truth came into the world. And so truth became a lifeline of salvation for them that wanted to take heed to it. But when light came into the world and people see it as, I don't want to hear it, it became what? Condemnation. It caused death. Okay? <clears throat> Anything concerning truth, whether it be the entertainment industry, the wickedness in Masonic, uh, you know, all the Masons and secret societies, all, anytime light and truth comes into the world and you choose to love your old fashioned deeds of darkness, you're choosing condemnation. Okay. Noah heard the warning and he took action. He built the boat and he saved his family. Okay. So Noah built something that condemned the world and saved his family. Jesus is building, also building something that condemns the world and saves his family. What is it? You said Jesus built Jesus is also building something that condemns the world and saves his family. The church? Yes, the congregation. He said, on this rock, I will build my congregation and the gates of hell will not prevail. And so... We don't have to we don't we have to really pay attention to the fact that Jesus said as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. That's not an accident. People think, oh Noah man, that was that was hard. God was harsh. He only saved eight people. Everybody else died. Man, I'm glad we're in the New Testament. Everybody's gonna be saved. <laughs> I don't think so. Right? He said, Are there few that disciples asked Jesus, he said, are there few that be saved? And he said, enter into the straight gate. Make sure you find a narrow way because many will seek to enter and they will not be able to get in. Just like all those people tried to get into that, that ark. Too late. They were not able to get in. Only eight people were saved. Those are the things that Jesus talked about. So Jesus didn't separate himself from Noah. Jesus made himself almost the same as Noah. Okay, Jesus is building something that, that will condemn the world. That means as soon as we get in, as soon as we get all the way in, there's going to be a flood of fire. Not water this time, but fire. As soon as we get all the way in, there's judgment coming. So we need to get all the people in we can. Okay? Jesus is building something that condemns the world and saves those that believe in him. Matthew 16, 18. Also, I, I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my congregation, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So what kind of gates opened after Noah built his ark? The gates of hell. Nope. What kind of gates open? Oh, the floodgates. The floodgates, right? Did the floodgates of water prevail against the ark that Noah built? No. Nope. All the water came down, the water came up, the water came sideways, right? It came down the, the gates of heaven, all the, the firmament was opened up, right? The water came up. The water came up from the bottom and from above, right? All the water came from up, from down, from sideways. It did not prevail against the ark that Noah built. Yeah? So guess what? See, when Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my congregation in the gates of hell, will not prevail against it? What is he saying? He's saying, the, so the first time there was a flood, it was a flood by water. First Peter said the second time, the earth was going to be destroyed by what? Fire. Fire. What is hell full of? 
So the gates of hell will not prevail against the ecclesia, against the assembly of God. Okay? So when fire comes from everywhere, only those that are in the ecclesia will be protected from it because the gates of hell will not prevail against the ecclesia that Jesus is building. That's why it's very important to understand that this is the thing that Christ is building and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So just like Noah built a boat that condemned the world and saved his family, Jesus is building a congregation that condemns the world and saves his new family of those that believe in him. Those that believe in him, those that obey the gospel, those are the people that will be saved from the gates of hell and the fire that comes from the gates of hell. So this is the condemnation, but this is also what? The salvation. The condemnation is coming, but the salvation is also available. There's an opportunity to, to hear the message of the gospel and receive condemnation, but there's also an opportunity to hear the message of the gospel and receive salvation. There's an opportunity to see the church being built and receive condemnation, but there's also the opportunity to see the church being built and receive the salvation. Amen. Okay? Just like the floodgates of water did not prevail against Noah's Ark, the floodgates of the fire of hell will not prevail against the true assembly of believers that is doing what Christ instructed. He said, upon this rock I will build my um, ecclesia, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. At the same time, our obedience to Jesus condemns the world. The preaching of Jesus gives us the opportunity to save the world. Okay, so just like Noah was building an ark that condemned the world, we're building what? A congregation that condemns the world. But guess what? Noah also preached righteousness in an attempt to save the world. And we can also preach Jesus in an attempt to save the world. So this is the, the condemnation. And this is also the salvation. John 5.24. Let's go to John 5.24. A couple chapters over from John 3. John 5 verse 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation. Okay, so when you hear the word and you have a soft heart and you believe it, then you will not come into condemnation. You will come into salvation. You will pass from death to life. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Verse 1. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation. Or I say no condemnation. No to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So if you walk after the flesh, you will have condemnation. But if you walk after the Spirit, there is what? No condemnation. Okay? For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak to the flesh... God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. So the righteousness of the law will be fulfilled in those who walk in the flesh not after the spirit. So the law of sin and death does not apply to those who walk in the spirit. But the righteousness of the law is fulfilled and us who walk in the Spirit. So people say the law has passed away, but guess what? The righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us 
So that's not passed away. The righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us that walk after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Okay, so the Spirit of God is very necessary to be able to walk in salvation instead of condemnation. You know, there are things that you, you know, you may want to be delivered from. There are things that you want to get free from. There are things that you want to walk in on a higher level. Okay, how do we do that? We do it by the Spirit of God. Okay, the Spirit of God is what helps us to keep the teaching and instruction of God. That's what the law really is, is teaching and instruction. Not the curse of sin and death, but teaching and instruction of righteousness. And so the Spirit will lead us when to do these things. The Spirit will lead us and show us how to do these things. The Spirit will lead us and show us how to fast, how to tarry for Him, how to be pure, how to, how to get delivered, how to to walk in more and more holiness. The Spirit will show us how to keep His commandments. When we have the Spirit, okay, He will help us. And that's where that's what Jesus came to do. He came to give us the Holy Spirit so that we can fulfill the righteousness of the law. That means we can do His the ways, do the things He asked us to do. Okay? Let's turn to Galatians chapter 3. The Spirit of God is necessary for us to walk in salvation instead of condemnation. We can walk in salvation and not condemnation if we walk in the Spirit and obey the Spirit of God and do what He's leading us to do, which is keeping His commandments. Galatians chapter 3. Sure. This is the condemnation and this is the salvation. We're talking about how to move from condemnation into salvation and how to lead others from condemnation into salvation because a lot of people feel condemned when they see you obeying God when they see you doing what God said they feel condemned but you can lead people into salvation and away from condemnation Galatians 3 chapter Galatians chapter 3 verse 24 says wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith but after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. When you've been baptized into Christ, you put on Christ. The law is our schoolmaster that leads us to Christ. What does the law tell us? You shall not sin, right? You shall not sin against God. You shall not sin against people. And it's hard to do that, right? And so the law teaches us. It's a schoolmaster that leads us to Christ because it says you can't rebel against God. You can't have idols. You got to keep the Sabbath holy. You got to do this. You have to honor God and love him with your whole heart. You can't murder. You can't commit adultery. You can't lie. You can't steal. You can't covet. You can't even covet in your own heart. The law tells us that. So it's a schoolmaster that leads us to Christ because when we're instructed to do these things we're like man that goes against everything inside me i need jesus <laughs> right so the law is a schoolmaster that leads you to christ right some people look at the scripture and they say well the law is a schoolmaster that leads us to christ therefore once we find christ we forget the law that's not what it said though okay it said we're no longer under the schoolmaster the law teaches us god's will Right? So, when you go to college, do you forget everything you learned in high school? No. But you're not under your high school teacher anymore. But did you forget everything you learned in high school? No. <laughs> you may have forget some of it, right? But not everything, right? Yes, Obviously, because you need the knowledge to go to the next level. Right? Um, 
Who knows their times tables? What grade you learn your times tables? Third grade? Yeah, yeah. Okay, third grade, you learn your times tables in second grade, third grade? Okay. What's three times five? <laughs> Wait a minute, you're not in third grade anymore. Why are you still talking about your times tables? We're not under the law. We're not under the times tables anymore. What's six times six? 30. Huh? 36. 36? What are you talking about? You're not, you're not under, the, under your time tables no more? I'm you're grown. You're grown. You don't need to know six times six no more. You're not under under the time tables anymore, right? You're grown. Does that make sense? <laughs> no, because once you learn under a schoolmaster, you go to the next level, but you still know what you learned under the schoolmaster, right? Okay, so that's what the scripture means when it says the law is a schoolmaster that leads us to Christ. We're no longer under the schoolmaster, but we never forget what we learned that led us to Christ. We never forget. That's why when we have Christ, we fulfill the righteousness of the law. We still walk in his ways. We still walk in the commandments. The law is teaching and instruction. Okay. When you're under the schoolmaster, you're supposed to learn something, right? When you're under the schoolmaster, you learn something. You don't forget it. But once you graduate, now you produce with it. Okay, once you get your job, now you're making money with it. Now you're actually producing with it. Same thing, once, you, once you're under the schoolmaster, you learn what God wants. But then when you get Christ, you start doing what God wants. You do what you learned. Okay, and the spirit will help you. Okay, just like when you uh, go to school, you learn all this stuff, and then when you get a job, you start producing. You don't forget everything you learn, you start producing with it, and then you get paid. Same thing in Christ. Once you get in Christ, you do what you learned that brought you to Christ. Some of the things that convicted you, that made you repent, that made you believe in Him. Then you continue doing those things that you learned that led you to him. But the only difference now is now you're getting paid. Now you're getting eternal rewards. Now you actually have the power to do it. Now you actually have the resources in yourself, the grace to do his commandments and to do his will. That's why he said the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in those that walk in the spirit. Because you're endued with the power of the spirit. That's your part of your, your, your grace. It's almost like your salary and your... You're commissioning to do his will. Okay? So, right now, <clears throat> a lot of what I call the apostate church or the church that doesn't keep his commandments, they preach the salvation of Jesus, but they live in a condemnation of disobedience. So we have condemnation and we have salvation. And many people talk about Jesus, but they're still living in condemnation. Why? Because they're not doing the warnings. They're not heeding the commandments of God. They're not following the teaching and instruction of Jesus. Okay? The floodgates of hell will prevail against the false church. The floodgates of hell will prevail against those that rebel against the warning. Those that those that receive condemnation instead of the lifeline of salvation, right? But what we have to do is we have to obey and preach. We can't be the people that don't obey, but just preach and just talk about Jesus, but don't obey Jesus. We have to both obey and we have to preach, okay? If we preach and don't obey, we condemn ourselves. Remember, Noah built the boat and then condemned the world. If he didn't build the boat, who would have been condemned? Himself. He would have drowned too. So we have to take action and obey. That way we save ourselves. But we also have to preach salvation to others. That way we can save others. Amen? So we have to obey God to save ourselves. And then we have to preach to give people the lifeline for them to, so we can save others. If we preach and don't obey, we condemn ourselves. If we obey and do not preach, we will condemn others. So we have to do both. We have to both obey him 
and we have to preach him. So let's prove that we are the sons of God by walking in the Spirit, producing salvation, and not walking in the condemnation of lawlessness. Don't be tempted to walk in lawlessness and to walk in disobedience to the Son of God because then you're living in the condemnation and not in the salvation. So what do we have to do? We have to preach repentance to the commandments of God. We have to teach the kingdom of God. We have to heal the sick. We have to cast out devils. The things that we've been talking about, we have to make disciples. That's what he's given us to do. Okay? We have to preach repentance. We have to teach the kingdom. We have to heal the sick. We have to cast out devils. And we have to make disciples. That's what we're called to do. This is a new season. It's a new beginning. Okay? It's a time where we have everything we need. We've been given the instruction that we need. We have built the ark, the ecclesia that condemns the world. But we've also built the ark that saves the world. Condemnation is available, but also salvation is available. Okay? The commandments, the gospel of the kingdom, the commandments of the Father and the Son, and the ordinances of the Father, of, of Jesus Christ comprise the ecclesia. That's what Jesus gave his apostles when he said, On this rock, I will build my congregation, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's this is what he has given us that will not be prevailed by the fire that's coming from hell. So we have the commissioning and the opportunity to preach salvation as we build the ark that the gates of hell would not prevail against. So repentance, forgiveness, okay? Everybody say repentance. repentance. Everybody say forgiveness. forgiveness. Everybody say healing. Healing. Everybody say deliverance. deliverance. That's casting devils out. Okay. Everybody say faith. faith. That's when you believe in Jesus. Everybody say obedience. obedience. That's when you obey his commandments. Everybody say baptism. baptism. That's when you go under the water as an old person and then you come up in Christ. Okay. You die under the water and then you come up a brand new person. Everybody say baptism. baptism. Everybody say Holy Spirit power. Holy Spirit power. That's when you're filled with the Spirit to overflowing. We talked about tearing. Okay? When the Holy Spirit overflows you and it comes, the Holy Spirit comes out of your mouth. Everybody say grace. 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 The grace is the power and favor of God. These are all tools that we have and they're tools of salvation. They're tools of salvation. These are tools of salvation. Repentance, forgiveness, healing, deliverance. Faith, obedience, baptism, Holy Spirit power, grace. These are all tools of salvation that are at our disposal. So that not only are we obeying God and building an ark that condemns the world, but we're also using these tools to save the world. So we must preach as we obey, and we must obey as we preach. And I'm going to say this. Pay attention, I'll probably say it three times. <laughs> Those that have become obedient have the greatest ability and responsibility to preach. Those that have become obedient, those that are doing what he said, Noah, okay? If you're not building the ark, what are you going to say to anybody? If, if there's a flood coming and you're not building the ark, what are you going to preach about? Come hang out with me and, and die together? <laughs> right? That would, that would be your message. Okay? But when you're building the ark, what do you have to preach about? Come and get saved. Right? Those that have become obedient have the greatest ability and responsibility to preach. Write that down. I'm probably say it three times. <laughs> Those that have become obedient have the greatest ability and responsibility to preach. 
there's a lot of people preaching that are not obedient. What are they really doing? They're just out. They don't, they're not in the boat. Talking about, oh, come drown with me. I'm anointed. Come drown with me. Oh, I'm independent. I'm free in Christ. Come drown with me. Right? That's what a lot of people are doing in the apostate church. Because they are not in the boat that Christ built. They've made up their own boat. They've made up their own denomination. They've made up their own ministry, their own organization, their own alternative styles of outreach. And they're out there preaching, and they don't have an ark. And what they're saying is, come drown with me because I'm anointed. Come drown with me because I have a loud voice. Come drown with me because I'm talented. Okay? So we cannot allow that to happen. Those that are, those that have become obedient have the greatest ability and responsibility to preach. We have to do this. We have to use repentance. We have to use forgiveness. We have to use healing. We have to use deliverance. We have to use faith. We have to use obedience, baptism, Holy Spirit, power, and grace. Because these are the tools of salvation we can use to save people that are already condemned. They're already condemned. Was he crying? Okay. Let's turn to Luke 4, last scripture. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Right here. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Everybody say, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to who? The poor. The poor. He is. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. So when the Spirit of the Lord is upon you, you have to preach the gospel to who? The rich? The rich? The poor? You got to hang around the cool people? No. You got to hang around the rich people? No. You got to hang around the Freemasons? No. You got to hang around the superstars? No. When the Spirit of the Lord is upon you, who do you preach the gospel to? The poor. The poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to who? The captives. You got to find the captives. You got to find the broken. You got to find the poor. Okay? And recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are what? Bruised. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. The acceptable year of the Lord is Jubilee year where debt is forgiven. Oh. Debt is forgiven. It's where everything kind of turns okay. over. <laughs> it's where everything turns around. <laughs> where everybody that's been in debt and poor is getting their property back. Okay? So that's the year of Jubilee. So those that have become obedient, those that have built the ark that Jesus has instructed, those that have built the congregation that is, has been designed to prevail against the gates of the fire that comes from the gates of hell, from up, from down, and from sideways, right? Those are the ones that have to preach. Those are the ones that have to find the poor. They have to find the broken. They have to find the captives and, and um, preach deliverance to them. We have to use the tools of salvation. Why? Because we're already building the tool that condemns our obedience condemns the world so now we have a responsibility to use the tools that save the world amen, amen. our obedience already condemns the world so now we have to use the tools that he has given us to save the world so how do we do that 
gonna say the same thing I said last week. Number one, pray about it. <laughs> pray about using your gifts to preach. Pray about the anointing that God has given you. Pray about seeking out the poor. Pray about preaching repentance. Pray about the kingdom. Pray about um, preaching forgiveness. Pray about healing the sick. Pray about casting out devils. Pray about teaching people about obedience. Pray about baptizing people. Pray about filling, being filled with the Spirit. Pray about using God's power. Pray about it. Number two, talk about it. <laughs> okay? Pray about it. Talk about it. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. If God is giving you this word, talk about it. Okay? Pray about it. Talk about talk about the tools of salvation. How are you going to save people? How are you going to save people that are already condemned? Okay? Pray about it. Fast about it. Terry, get the power of God. Talk about it. And then go about it. Pray about it. Fast about it. Talk about it. Go about it. And what's the last one? Don't worry about it. You know why? Because it's his power that does it. So there's no pressure on us. All we have to do is walk in his power. Okay? So this is the condemnation. When you are obedient to God, you are condemning the world. But this is also the salvation because he's given us the tools to save the world. Amen? Amen. 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 Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and your kindness towards us. We thank you for your mercy, your goodness, and your loving kindness. We thank you for giving us the tools of salvation that we can throw out lifelines um, to people that are condemned in disobedience and in ignorance. We thank you and we praise you for anointing us with the power to, um, to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, and recovering of the sight to the blind. To set at liberty those that are bruised, Father, send us to preach repentance, to teach the kingdom, to heal the sick, to cast out devils, hallelujah, to spread forgiveness, um, to spread obedience, to spread faith in Jesus, um, deliverance from devils, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. We thank you and praise you that this is the the ark that you are building, your ecclesia is the ark that you are building, and there are no other options that will prevail against the fire that comes from the gates of hell. We thank you, Father, that we, even though we are outnumbered, um, that you have called us to save many, just like uh, Noah and only had eight, and he was able to save two and seven of every animal in the earth. But this time, Father, uh, that we will be able to save people and not just animals from the wrath that is to come. In the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen. Amen.